we're um, very privileged um, to have Professor Manoj Sivan join us today. Um, he is Associate Professor, Professor in Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Leeds, and he is um, one of the chief investigators in the locomotion study. Um, so thank you for joining us and over to you, Manoj. No, thank you so much, uh, Leslie, and thank you, Mel, as well. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I guess, I mean, that's been full on, actually. <laughs> so I don't know whether people want a break, but I'm more than happy to make this very light um, so that it's not so intense. What I've done is for half an hour, I'm just presenting four or five papers we've done in this kind of um, field um, so that it's kind of, you know, um, quite easy to kind of understand what we are saying. So I am um, part of the Leeds Long COVID Service and I'm, as Leslie said, the Chief Investigator for Locomotion and I have a particular interest in um, dysautonomia. I've been working with uh, uh, Chris Mathias uh, and others uh, in this space. Um, those are the five papers I'm going to cover. And I think um, um, the uh, Denise has already sent the papers. Um, so obviously, you know, you can refer to those if there's anything more needed. Um, just spend about five minutes each paper, I suppose. Now, this is actually a letter. Um, now, this brings back the question of, well, are we under diagnosis or are we over diagnosis dysautonomia and 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 for me it's very clear uh, when you look at all the literature that we are definitely under diagnosing um, and the pandemic and long covid has provided us with this opportunity really to understand more about dysautonomia because it's so common in post viral syndromes and you see residual symptoms. Um, you've seen we've seen residual symptoms in in all the pandemics we've had in SARS and MERS and all the other post viral syndromes. So this is nothing new. Uh, I think the scale of the problem of long COVID, um, um, which is currently about two hundred million um, globally, uh, at least two million in the UK, it it it, it provides us basically with this. Um, um, uh, with this caseload to understand dysautonomia better. And there seems to be kind of the viral predilection for uh, the autonomic nervous system, which we are discussing today. So, um, which is, to be honest, is poorly understood, um, even, you know, in terms of training in medical school and, and, and uh, you know, other allied health professionals. I think there is lack of proper training in um, how to, uh, you know, manage problems with the autonomic nervous system. Um, and there is also a lot of skepticism, disbelief attached to this. Um, so there's various facets to this, why it's actually not come to the forefront, this autonomia. And, you know, still to date, we don't have specialists. Um, we have a few, but we don't have specialist, specialist autonomic medicine clinics. Um, uh, and if you link that, or if you put that in the context of the scale of the problem, there is something missing. So how come you have such a huge burden, but lack of specialist clinics? Um, so this is the editorial we wrote. I think people here might knew, uh, might know um, Julia Newton, professor in uh, Newcastle. So we look, and Vicky McKeever is a specialist GP with an interest in um, uh, autonomic medicine. So um, this is, um, we, we have done some work around this and we're kind of raising awareness in long COVID clinics that we must be considering this as, you know, when you look at the differentials uh, for long COVID. Um, and moving on to the next paper on locomotion. So I think um, Leslie referred to this paper quite a few times in terms of the prevalence of um, um, orthostatic intolerance, which is basically um, a manifestation of um, autonomic dysfunction um, in long COVID. So when we started doing this work, so um, locom locomotion is kind of um, a consortium of uh, about 10 uh, NHS clinics um, across three nations with uh, six universities involved. And when we started doing the evaluation work in long COVID, we found that the prevalence of abnormalities on Nasaline test or the active stand test was quite high. So then people started bringing in aspects of deconditioning and also whether it's actually how prevalent is it is in healthy volunteers. 
So hence, we did this study where we looked at 277 long COVID patients and we had 50 healthy volunteers. And, you know, there's there's some tables there, there's some graphs here, just actually to show the point that if you look at the lowermost graph, um, it is healthy volunteers where you can see what is the kind of the change in their heart rate from supine position on the 10-minute Lasaline test. And you can see the difference in those who have POTS. And in terms of prevalence, um, so, so sorry, so this basically graph demonstrates that it is quite different from healthy volunteers in terms of the findings of active stand test or the Nasaline test in long COVID, suggesting a, a relationship, really. Um, causation can be challenged, but there is a relationship between the symptoms and what we find on this test. Um, so this is um, some of the figures Leslie's were referring to that in um, long COVID patients, you see a prevalence of about 7%. Now, that is 7% is going by the definition of your heart rate being sustained um, for at least two consecutive readings. So you need to have at least two readings where it is more than 30 and they need to be like a minute or a two minute apart on a 10 minute stand test. But when you speak to people like Chris Matthias, he would say that actually the sustain, we don't know where it's come from. Even one single rise, um, about 30, is actually, um, and if it's and if their patients is symptomatic, then that needs to be considered a positive test. Now, when I come to describing the AAP, um, um, you will see that actually there's no definition of sustain. Once you get a peak uh, of rise, then it is considered positive if the patient is symptomatic. That's the key thing. The patient needs to be symptomatic and you need to have a corresponding change in the physiological uh, parameters. Now, there are some people who believe that the changes should be um, abnormal throughout the 10 minutes. Now, again, we're not sure where that's come from because literature is very clear Either it's one peak or it's actually two consecutive readings. It is definitely not throughout the 10 minutes uh, of reading. Now, um, orthostatic hypotension is 8%. Now, when you remove that diagnosis of actually uh, the criteria of being sustained for two readings, that actually jumps that 7% to a higher rate of um, um, 15%. Um, so that is roughly what we are finding in terms of the prevalence of POTS and OH. Uh, in long COVID. Now, this is only going by the thresholds which are defined by the various guidelines, the Canadian guidelines and the British um, um, Society, uh, Heart Failure Society, that um, um, those thresholds. So there is this gray zone of rise of about 20 to rise about 30. So between 20 and 30, there is actually no consensus and the patients actually are symptomatic. So in this study, what we found is half of the patients actually had symptoms on active stand test or the Nasaline test, um, even though they didn't meet, uh, even, only, even though only about 15% met the criteria for POTS, about half of them were symptomatic. So they were between that 20 and 30 zone. So what we are tending to do in clinical practice is if they are symptomatic and if they are between that 20 and 30, I think the measures or the management strategies you employ for POTS or for OH, they need to be used for these patients as well uh, because um, of that gray area and because patients are symptomatic and just because on a single test they're not meeting that threshold, I think it's it's it's. Um, um, I, I think it's not appropriate not to consider dysautonomia in the differential diagnosis. Um, moving on to the third paper on AAP. So obviously, stand test, tilt test, they're all one-off tests. But what, what tools do we have for the patients to manage at home? And they can do a series of lean, lean tests at home. And this is the AAP test. So this is where it sits, really, um, because you have these various tests. Um, whereas you need one test which can be repeated at home by patients on their own using a, a blood pressure monitor and a diary sheet and also in relation to different triggers. So the tests, were, what we've talked about, uh, are all rela in relation to position. But what about other triggers, the daily triggers of activity and, um, and food, um, um, which are also equal um, triggers and also the cognitive and the emotional side of things, which actually are triggers for these fluctuations. So here's a patient's AAP diary, and you can see this patient is actually already on propanolol. And you can see that uh, in spite of that, you can see the rise in heart rate 
um, with not significant change in blood pressure. And you can see the symptoms there, dizziness, uh, heart raising, shortness of breath. Um, and you can see that happens after breakfast. It happens after exertion. Um, and um, so what, what this provides basically is some kind of a feedback to the patient that they can understand what their triggers are and um, they can make some adjustments. So the food amount is too large. For example, uh, here you can see the breakfast and then you cut down on the amount. If there's too much of carbohydrates, you make some adjustments. So it's kind of a self-monitoring tool that you, you want these fluctuations to be minimal. You can see that activity, huge surge. It's almost doubling heart rate really after three minutes of exertion. So that means you are hitting that threshold of crashing. Um, how much time do I have uh, actually, Denise? Do we know? Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Hi. Sorry. No, I'm back on. Hi. Um, it's five to ten now. So. Um, okay. So another. Well, I'll I'll rush through the rest of the slides. I'll finish at um ten. Um, so the fourth paper was the heart rate. So obviously we've been talking a lot about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system and what can be done, especially in long COVID, you can use, um, um, gadgets, which can give you a HRV, your heart rate variability, and you can do biofeedback. So you can do parasympathetic training, breathing technique, looking at the HRV display on your app and, um, and, and try to kick in the parasympathetic system and control um, that kind of surge of the sympathetic system, or in other words, increase the HRV. So this is a study we've just published the results of um, 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 it in a sample. There's two papers coming mm -hmm. out. One which is already out there is 60, is 15 patients, and the other one we've done on 30 patients. So basically, patients have a chest strap, mm -hmm. and that feeds into uh, an app which gives them the HRV, and they do the breathing techniques, and they do the breathing techniques to basically increase the HRV on the app. And that is basically um, trying to control that dysautonomia. And you can see the changes which are across the, um, the condition specific measure for long COVID C19 virus and the compass we talked about, uh, a specific for autonomic symptoms and the HUDAS and the EQ5D significantly changing with eight weeks of every day, twice, 10 minutes of training on the HRV biofeedback. So this will be the final paper on pacing. Now, obviously, we believe that the dysautonomia is linked to the immune system and the hormonal system, and that overexertion actually pushes you through your energy envelope and causes you to basically um, crash. Um, um, and that is the kind of the boom and the bust pattern. And what is really needed is the person to remain within those energy limits. And you could see the previous patient's heart rate almost doubling within three minutes of activity. And that is clearly abnormal. We would like people to be within or within the kind of the 60% of their heart rate limit. So um, the pacing protocol uh, was developed by us for the WHO. And um, well, this is, a f I think you probably all are aware of PESE or PEM or the crash, what it's called, which is a characteristic feature of long COVID, the boom and the bust pattern. And this is what we wrote for the WHO. Um, it's a modification of the BOG protocol um, uh, and looking at the different kind of RPE exertion levels and how there are different phases and how somebody needs to be within a kind of an early phase and be crash free before actually they progress to a higher phase of um, a, a slightly higher activity level. Um, because what happens if you're if you somebody who's recovering from the condition, any post-viral condition, and you're still kind of having that crash pattern, boom and bust, and you are pretty much you know running and going to the gym at level four, level five, you keep crashing and you're never going to recover. So you've got to come back and draw back into zone phase one, phase two, and then you have to be crash-free before you progress. And that is the kind of the pacing protocol. And this study we did again, um, it's, it's in public domain, it's being published. You can see the long COVID patients. And this is what happens with uh, uh, intervention that actually gradually uh, the line which you say, the, the, the graph you're seeing is basically um, the activity level actually can go up. And these bars are basically the crashing episodes or the PESE episodes are coming down, whereas the, the, the activity level is gradually going up, even though that was not the intention. The, the whole point is once you 
get control of your pesi episodes better then gradually actually your energy envelope will actually expand now this is another way of showing what happens in in whether your activity increases decreases or stay the same by following this protocol your crash your 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 crash episodes or the pesi episodes actually coming down and that is the key for recovery for long covid or any other post viral condition um few other results it's all in the paper which has been sent to you all the quality of life increases as well so really what is needed in future i think is again referring back to those five papers you mm -hmm. need greater awareness of uh, post viral long term conditions and we have demonstrated that you have to do regular screening irrespective of whether the patients are presenting those top symptoms of dizziness palpitation fatigue irrespective of that i think all patients need an active lean test and clinic because you, you'll be surprised we've also shown in that same paper that patients who did not report those symptoms actually were symptomatic on the naselin test and they actually met the threshold for those as well we need mechanisms in biomarker research which obviously is a huge area and um, um hopefully there'll be more work in this in this field and then we need more intervention research and uh, and there is further talks later today on the pharmacological non pharmacological management but we also need to refine the pacing protocol and and probably do an rct on that but i think one message i would like to push through is definitely i think the country needs more specialist autonomic medicine clinics it's much less actually in the uk when compared to other countries and um especially after the pandemic i think this is a time to increase the awareness really otherwise you know the you the silent disability pandemic will continue thank you